Welcome everybody, my name is Daniel Hinojosa and uh, we're going to be talking about Scala and um, um, we're going to uh, take a look at some of the uh, sample code that I've been uh, using for years and uh, over here is the repository so if you want to note this repository uh, you could come over here and uh, download some of the examples yourself. I'll have some challenges at the end that would be your homework. Have you ever gotten homework from like a, a Java user group? This would be your first. Uh, I demand that you turn it in in a week. <laughs> so um, here's my contact information. Here's my repository, uh, 2H, 92, V6, and small f, if you, uh, if you want um, to uh, get this after, afterwards, by all means, go right ahead. Um, want more in depth? Uh, I have a uh, video that's uh, doing really well on Safari, and it's called uh, Beginning Scholar Programming. Uh, it's uh, one of my pride and joys, and I go through uh, lots of details when it comes to the Scholar Programming language. So uh, let me do a, um, just a quick uh, landscape view of, of Java in your environment. How many of you are Java day in, day out, love it? Wish you could marry it? Okay. Uh, how many of you are? Uh, how many of you um, are uh, Java eight all the time? Not any kind of new one. Java nine, ten, eleven. You know what? This is the first time that a version of Java came out, and I didn't realize it did. And uh, this was definitely a first, just because uh, Java gets released so fast now that I'm, I don't even know when they get released. So I guess uh, in March, uh, twelve came out. How many are twelve? Wow. Okay. So. I figure since there was no 11. All right, let me just ask about like some of the alternate uh, programming languages. Uh, Groovy. Okay, oh, good, good amount of hands. How many of you are do Scala? Since I'm going to be talking about Scala here. Okay, oh, I like that rules. <laughs> right, good. Uh, let's see, uh, Kotlin. Okay. <laughs> All right, excellent. Uh, let's see, am I missing with Clojure? Okay, Cricket's great. All right, so. Uh, <laughs> So uh, good to uh, understand the landscape here. I saw some of you uh, are, uh, or a, a, good, a good percentage of you are not uh, Scala programmers, so that's what this is about. Uh, but I've always considered um, Denver to be uh, a functional programming paradise. Um, don't tell anyone. Oh, th there's a video anyway. But I will just say that I truly believe that you know, a good portion of high IQ programmers are in this area, and a good portion of the functional programmers are. So, uh, since I believe that anyway, I decided let's just jump right into functions. Uh, and like, let's not talk about classes and the simple stuff and how to create variables, but let's just jump right in into functions, how functions work, what they do, and then we'll talk about our favorite functions, map, filter, flat map, zip, for each, reduce, et cetera. So let me just uh, talk about Scala. Scala is a, uh, both an object-oriented programming language as well as a functional programming language. Uh, it was that before Java became such a beast as well, because remember, Java had always been like an object-oriented programming language, uh, but not necessarily a functional programming language. Now it seems every language is now that object uh, functional programming language. Uh, I've always considered Scala to be that language that uh, allows you to peer into the future as to what Java is going to be. Um, so. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll describe one of those instances uh, when, we, uh, when we discuss this, okay? Um, so I want this question-based, and uh, if you have a question, uh, please ask, and uh, that's what this is all about. All right, ready to dive in? Okay, all right. So uh, Scala, I'm going to uh, start things off with traits. Now, if you see something that is a little bit weird, like, hey, a tuple, what is that? Uh, by all means, just ask away, and then we'll go ahead and fill in uh, what a tuple is or something like that. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, this is the uh, project. Uh, let me go into presentation mode, one of the great things that I truly enjoy about uh, IntelliJ. And uh, yeah, let's go right in here. And um, if you ever want to uh, download this project and use it for your studying, I'm a truly big believer in using testing frameworks to learn. Um, I like writing little specifications uh, to allow me to understand what the language does, and I'll do this here as well. So if you want to go into here, I have this particular function spec, and this is going to be uh, my particular slide deck over here. 
And I want to talk about some of the aspects of the Scala programming language uh, using this. Now, this right in here is function one. Function one is a trait. In Scala, we use a trait. This is analogous to an interface when it comes to uh, Java, but we call it a trait, okay? Just a different term, but one of the things that we have about a trait is that we can mix in and do a, a variety of different things with it. So this one here is a function one. So in Scala, we have function one. Now, uh, what I have here is a uh, square bracket. Now, in Java, you have this. I'm not part of a gang. I'm just telling you this is the way we do generics. Uh, in Scala, the generics are like this. They're the square brackets that we have over here. So string coming in, int coming out. So if, uh, another quick poll here. So for those who do Java now, how, how good are you with the lambdas? Have you, uh, do you do a lot of lambdas? Okay, so if you've done a lot of lambdas, you've probably noticed that within the Java API, it is, uh, it is what, it's called function with a generic type of T and R. This right here, the string that you see here is the T. This right here is the R, the T and the R. Now here's this uh, one item here called function one, that's the name, this is analogous to the Java util function that you see within Scala. And then I have this property in here called apply. Now, I want to go ahead and go over here and take a look within uh, the Scala API right in here. So I'm gonna click on Scala API and I'm gonna look for function one, okay? Now one of the things about Scala is that Functions go from Scala 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to number 22. And we all know what significance the number of 22 is for developers, right? I'm just kidding, I just made that part up. There's no relevance to it. It's just an arbitrary number that they decided to stop at. But here's that trait. I'm still getting some flashes here. Are we doing all right? Okay, best we could do. All right. So right in over here are the signatures. So one of the signatures I have is apply and then compose and to string. Now keep this in mind, Scala had this uh, years ago. Uh, it's, it's part of the core. Now, if I take a look at Java util function dot function, if I take a look at this signature here, let me do that, and I'm gonna go ahead and bring this up from uh, JDK8. Take a look at the method names. Keep in mind, Scala came first, and this was Java. Now, I'm not saying Java copied Scala. Yes, I did. And um, so as you can see right here, <laughs> along with the signatures here, we have an apply, a compose, and then. If I take a look at how it looks within Scala, apply, compose, and then. Ah, oh, interesting. Interesting signature in the way this was done, okay? So, it just so happens that, yes, it's, it's exactly or nearly exactly the same as it is in Scala. But there is a significance when it comes to apply. So, over here is a Scala REPL. Let me just uh, fill you in on a little bit about apply, which I think if you were going to take on the Scala programming language, I think is the most important part when it comes to learning the language, okay? So, what I'm going to do, can you see the uh, font, everyone? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna do a class foo, and uh, right in here I'm going to bring in an int. Now, in Scala, this class right over here has a uh, primary constructor, okay? This is our default constructor. Our default constructor is everything. When you instantiate something within um, Scala, you give it all the information up front. The reason, immutability. We don't do setters like Java programmers do. We don't create objects and then decide later, eh, let's add something else to it. We want to give it everything up front for that immutability. So what you're seeing here is both the class and the value associated with it. All right, now, how we create a method in Scala is very much like this, okay? Method is with def, bar is coming in, and uh, I'll have a variable called y with a type of int, okay? And then what I'm going to do as part of the implementation is this. Now in Scala, if it has an equals, that means we are returning something. 
If it does not have an equals, it is essentially a void, or what we functional programming nerds will call unit. Okay, fun stuff. So I'm going to do this here. There we go. And I'm going to do a val foo. Val, by the way, is our final. Okay. So val foo, new foo, with numero 10. Okay. And here we go. And now I'm going to call foo.bar uh, number 20 right over here. Okay. 30, right? Isn't programming great? <laughs> All right. Now, we could also run this as an infix operator. So what's an infix operator? If I do this, this is certainly legal in Scala as well, by providing spaces between the object, the bar, and the 30 right over here. Okay? Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Okay? Everyone good? All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it all over again, and I'm going to do the following. Class foo, let me come back over here, but instead of bar, I'm going to call this apply. Here it is. Here's the apply and done. So I'm going to do this again, and I'm going to do a foo of this, and I have a flu, uh, flu, I don't have the flu, thankfully, but I'm going to do a foo with apply uh, with 20, okay? Beautiful. What do you think the answer is going to be here? Remember, I'm calling it apply. I'm just kidding, it's going to be 30. All right, so here's the thing. What if I do this? Same. Apply is a magical method. Super magical unicorns, rainbows, and lollipops are all over the place. Okay? Now, if your method is called apply, you do not need to call it. Okay? Keep that in mind. So I'm going to head back over here into some of these functions. So this function one is like an interface. And I'm doing an anonymous instantiation right in here doing this new function one in here. Everyone know what an anonymous instantiation is in Java, right? Same thing with in Scala. I'm doing a new anonymous instantiation of this trait, aka interface of function one, the generic string and int, and the apply. So right in here, I get to call this particular function. Now, by the way, for this right over here, this is what I call a rocket ship. It's not the official term, it's what I like to call it. And this rocket ship says string to int, okay? So we have a wonderful language notation on here that this is something that takes a string and returns an int, okay? So when I call f1 apply with hello, what is the implementation of this? Well, I'm going to take any string, and I'm just going to determine the length of it. Pretty easy peasy, okay? So when I call this here, f1 hello, then this should be a 5 because the implementation of this is I'm going to bring in a string and I'm going to return uh, you know, the length of that. That just happens to be the implementation of my function. Now, I don't have to write all this much. I could just do it like this. So this is my second test that I have over here. Everything here is a green bar test. I don't necessarily have to run it. Uh, but on this test here, the above, uh, the above can be whittled down into the following. That given this string over here, I can just determine the length. It is the same thing as just more of a concise way to write that same information. So if I call f.apply, which by the way is the same kind of apply that you would use within a Java util function, um, then you know, that would invoke that particular function. It's eight letters inside of Zanzibar, so that would work great. So this signature in here that I'm showing off in my beautiful teal is that, hey, I am happy to accept a string, and I'm going to take that string and determine the length from it. Okay? Easy. And that's what a function is in Scala. Now, on here, take a look at the types. On this previous one, the type is on the right-hand side. On the next example, what I'm going to show you is the type on the left-hand side. So what we do in Scala is we decide which side the type should be on, on the right or the left. It's too noisy for us to have it on both sides. So we'll describe where the type is. 
if you get to Java 11, you'll, you'll venture into this world of deciding which side of the equation, literally, <laughs> which side of the equal sign you want to declare your types on. Okay? So, right over here, I'm declaring my type on the left-hand side, and over here is the implementation. Do I have to say s colon string on this that I have highlighted in teal? No, I don't, because that type is already encoded on the left-hand side. So if I apply the country name Andorra, anybody know where Andorra is? Yeah, Spain. Spain and? And France, right, it's this tiny little thing. I don't know if it's the smallest country or not, but yeah, it is definitely one of those countries. So if I call apply with Andorra, then that will be seven. But also, since the left-hand side has all the type information, uh, and uh, so on the right-hand side, we can trim some of that information. Now, before I get much further, uh, you probably just remembered that I said, hey, we have this thing called apply. So why can't I do this? And the answer is you most certainly can. I don't have to call the word apply. I think it is very, very important to understand that particular notion of that apply. Because learning Scala from here on out, everything will use this apply. And if anything looks mysterious, if you decide to learn Scala, does it, and you don't quite get it yet, just think about apply. Add an apply, and that's usually going to be the answer. Okay? All right. So here's something that I could do. Because I have the information on the left-hand side, here, let me bring it in over here on the REPL. So take a look over here. On the left-hand side, I'm declaring the type with this rocket ship. Let me kind of try to highlight my rocket ship. There it is. Here's my rocket ship. If you give me a string, I'll return an int. On the right-hand side, I have this funky little thing over here. Okay? Um, groovy programmers know this as the word it, but we use underscore. This is the same thing as doing this. Okay? But if I don't want to come up with a name for S, then I could just do this. Okay? So that's an underscore. So you could probably get the gist here that we don't like typing much. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to do something a little bit funky. So uh, let's say G over here. And uh, for this G, I want to do an int to an int. And uh, this will be, you know, maybe an X, bring that in, and I want to add 5, just like that example there. But I don't need that much information. Again, everything is coded on the uh, left-hand side, so I could just say X to X plus 5. That's the same thing. But I could also do this, underscore plus 5. Okay, right, everyone happy so far? Got it, okay. But addition is what, commutative? So I could do this. It's the same thing, okay. Now, here's a funny little rule. Is that if the equation on the right-hand side ends in a underscore, you don't need it. Everyone's all angry now. Damn it. <laughs> now, I have these uh, warnings in here. So these warnings are Scala, uh, is Scala compiler saying, whoa there. Look at, look at uh, Mr. or Mrs. Advanced here doing this programming. Hey, it's cool and all that you want to do this, but I'm just going to balk at you at, with this kind of warning in here since you're a super powerhouse with this language. Uh, so if you want to be this super powerhouse, uh, please let us know by turning on this import statement right over here. And there it is. Okay. Now when I run this, that disappears. Okay. Again, it's just Scala saying, wow, you're really impressive. Let us know that you meant to do that. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, we'll go ahead and allow you to do it. Okay. Groovy. Not groovy the language, just groovy how it's uh, all working out. All right. So... Uh, can anyone tell me what a closure is? Not the programming language. Go for it. Uh, something that uh, basically a value you try to just sort of like hand the access except for function that gets returned right. from that. And from the outside world. Yep. 
So here's a closure right in here, okay? So this closure in here is create function. So this def you see here is a method. I think you know how these, uh, all these types work out now. So def create function, an int is coming in and I'm returning an int to an int, okay? So this is a higher order function, kind of, because I have a method that's returning another function, okay? And I'm bending, I'm kind of like bending that spoon or I'm bending around the spoon or whatever. So I'm really getting into this functional programming <coughs> stuff here. So given this create function here, if I'm given this int i, I am going to take this information and return a function. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to embed this i into that function and return it. This i is coming from the outside world. This is what I'm closing around from the outside world and making it a part of that function. Everyone get that? Or is everyone just like, what the hell are you talking about? Okay. So that's a closure. You actually have closures within Java. You may uh, have stumbled upon it yet. Uh, how many of you use IntelliJ, just out of curiosity? So IntelliJ has this one cool thing when you do use a closure, is that you get a syntax coloring when you work with a closured variable. And it's purple. I don't know if you've uh, seen that or not. Yeah. So that's interesting when you go back, uh, take a look at that. Okay. All right. So uh, sorry about the fluctuations there. So I ought to be good here. So take a look at this uh, create function over here. So I have an add five function. And I'm calling a create function. So if I call this create function right over here, remember this is returning another function. So you could just like make function sandwiches with this language, okay? And so return another function, take that function and return another function and add that to another function, et cetera. And so this right here, by calling this create function, I am returning another function. This right here, I have a create function and I'm returning another function, okay? Sorry about the flicker there. So what I could do is I could do a map. How many of you are familiar with map? Okay, good number. Everyone loves a map, okay? If you are not, let's do a little, uh, little quick thing over here. So here's how I create a list. List uno, dos, tres, cuatro, okay? Or list.apply. Oh, what? Okay. This comes from something called an object. We have classes and we have objects. Now, one of the things I absolutely love about Scala is that they introduce this thing called an object. It takes a little bit to get used to. So we have classes and we have objects. What is an object? An object is a singleton. And uh, what I really love about Scala is they got rid of the word static. <laughs> and so whatever you put inside of an object is something that is static. Now, what I really enjoy about Scala is I don't have a mixture in a class of like static calls and instance calls, right? They're all mixed together. I would just like to have one place where like all the statics are in one place and all the non-statics are in another place. And that's what we're talking about here. Let me just give you a quick example here. Uh, list uh, my singleton in here, okay? Where if I have a def foo right in here, and if I do an x plus one, for example, uh, let's see. Some, oh, I don't have a X anywhere, unless I create an argument for it. Ah, sorry. Okay. Let's say I have something like this. Here's the singleton. It is a singleton. It is a single object in the object space. So if I call this, I'm going to call it like this. Okay. And this is going to return 11. Now let me ask you this. When I do this, and when I just make this call, I just showed you what the object is. If you came in from Java, would you, would you take a look at this and say this must be a static call? I mean, it has that look and feel to it. Um, and so that's our static call. So this object that I had just created there is that static call. So when you call something like this, this means that there is an object called a list, and it just happens to have an apply method uh, to it. And whenever I need to create a list, here is that, okay? So list one, two, three, four, 
dot map, and then for each element in here, you know what this arrow sign is. Scala's easy peasy. Now, by the way, just a little uh, soapbox, a little rant here. And that is that, what was I going to say? I was going to say something really good. All right, I remember what it is now. Um, how many of you tried Scala in, in the early days, like before JDK 8 was released? Okay. If you did and you bailed on it, um, I encourage you to come back afterwards. Because that practice that you've done with JDK 8 gives you a different mental philosophy with functional programming. And I would say coming back to Scala is a whole lot easier. Okay? Um, but if you've never been to Scala, again, you have a lot of practice with JDK 8, come on home. <laughs> All right, so uh, here's the map. So what are we doing here? We're just applying uh, a, that uh, one value or that one function on each element within that list. Okay? Beautiful stuff. All right. So that's the way we do that map. So if I have a method that returns a function, I could then take that function like that int to int and plug that into a map. One of the collections we have is called a vector. Okay, so we can take that vector one, two, three and plug in that function into the map. So we could do clever things like this using a closure. So take a look at this one. I want to create a method called less than that if I'm provided an int, sorry about the flicker, okay, uh, 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 all right. So if I bring something called, and it's done, sorry about the, error. okay, worth it, let's give it a try, okay, can you read that? Oh, you're like, yes. Or I'll do it this way. Good call. Okay. All right. So here's that less than with uh, x colon int, and that's returning an int to a Boolean. Everyone get this? I'm going to give it one variable, and I'm going to return a function from it. So this function that I'm going to return is, of course, another function where I'm going to determine whether y is less than x. See how I'm piggybacking from one method and I'm piggybacking to another function to deliver something else. Anybody want to wrap their head around this one here really quick? It's kind of funky. Okay. So this less than I could reuse multiple times. That's the beauty of a closure. So I could say, hey, is freezing Celsius uh, into Boolean? Well, I could just piggyback off of another function and say less than zero. Okay. Boom. Got it. Okay or less than 32, okay? What was, the, uh, what was the lowest temperature you had in Colorado this last year? It was a brutal winter. What was the lowest? Anybody know what the lowest was? Negative two? Okay. Probably lower? Okay. Was it negative 45? All right, so Chicago had like negative 45. And one of, the, one, of the, one of my favorite memes that I saw was, do uh, you remember, uh, what's that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that has that popular handshake? Which one was that one? Was that Predator? Where he has like, boom, and he has that handshake. Two, muscle, two muscled guys have that handshake and they look really awesome. But one of them was um, Fahrenheit and the other muscle was Celsius. And the handshake itself was negative 45 degrees. Which is awesome because negative 45 Celsius and Fahrenheit um, are the same. So anyway, so right in here, here's the idea of taking a function and reusing that function. So that's something you can do with a closure. Everyone okay with it before getting down into the murky, 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 murky waters? All right. So I love curry. Curry is delicious, but we're not talking about that. This is, uh, this is named after Haskell Curry which Haskell is the name of the programming language. And so this is currying. So if I take this right over here, let me bring this over to a terminal. That way we could just isolate it and focus on it. Give me a second here. Thanks again, Matt. I think that one fixed it up pretty nicely. All right, so if I have this function in here, what is this function? What is the signature here? 
If I bring in three ints, I will return one int. Okay? Three to one. Again, function, th uh, this is actually a function three because I'm bringing in three arguments and returning one. Remember, I have function one all the way up to function 22. So this is a three to one. Bring in three, return one. Boom. Okay? What happens if I call curried on this? Mmm. Curry. This changes into give me an int, and I'll return another function that if you give me an int, I'll return you another function that if you give me an int, I'll finally give you an int. Okay? This is providing a function that you could apply in piecemeal. Okay? Uh, someone had stated that, uh, oh yeah, I call this the builder pattern. What the? That is an outstanding way to describe it. This is taking a function with multiple arguments and making the builder pattern out of it. Okay? Hold on, I'm just going to cry right now because that was beautiful. <laughs> All right. So that's what it is. So if I have this f curried in here, let me, uh, let me assign it a val right in here. So val g. Okay? What can I do with this? g dot apply with a 3. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, g dot apply with a 3. What did I say about apply? Don't Done, don't need it. Here we go. So g3, if I give this the 3, now I'm making down payments on this function. Here we go. Okay. Now, on this REPL here, you'll see that I have a REST24. Okay. This is just a, if you, don't de if you don't declare it with a variable, one will be provided for you. But um, here, I'll just make this an H right in here. So val H is that. Okay. Then what can I do with this? How about val I is equal to H, and I will apply a 4 to it. Beautiful. So here's the I now. I'm going to do a J, and I'm going to call I with a 10. And then I'll finally get 17. You see how this looks like a builder pattern? Just make down payments to this, and then I'll just get that result from it. That's what a, that's what a curry will do. What's our use case for it? The use case is kind of like what you saw with the temperature thing. I only want to provide one argument and then whatever function I get ba uh, back, or let me restate that, whatever function I get back, I want to reuse this uh, in other places, okay? So it's kind of a partial application uh, when it comes to that. Yeah, please, go ahead. Okay. Yes. And so, yeah, you could do your own manual occurring if you want to, and that's, uh, that would be an example there. All right, how many of you are good with Compose for those that have been doing Java 8 or Scala? How many of you have mastered the Compose? Okay, good, good job. It's really weird though, right? You kind of have to move your head around and try to figure out uh, what is going on with it. So right over here is a Compose. Compose is essentially f of g of x, which is uh, what, something we learned in algebra long time ago, f of g of x. But in software, we kind of have to break it apart and think about it differently. So g of x needs to be found out first before we could take the result of that and then plug that into f, right? I mean, mentally, we, you know, we've been doing that easily and when we do our math. But in order to tell software to do it, eh, it gets kind of hard, OK? So this g of x in here, I need to figure g of x out first before I take that result and plug that into 5. So in order to work with it, let's say I have this. And I have something called tuple first. Okay, What is a tuple? So surprisingly, up what, what year is this? 2019. And Java came out in 1995. We do not have any official tuple yet. Is that right? I don't think 12 has a tuple yet either. There was something called a record that was supposed to come out, I thought, with 12, but it didn't. Uh, so I'm kind of bummed out. Okay? You would have to write your own tuples. And whatever library you bring in, you bring in your own tuples. We definitely need tuples. How many of you pronounce it tuples? Okay. Wow. All right. I'm just kidding. All right. So what is a tuple? A tuple is just a, as far as Scala goes, is just a dumb container of stuff. So I could have 
three foo and four dot zero. Okay, this is just my dumb container. Okay, have you ever wanted to return like two items from a method in in, uh, in Java and then you have like this weird teardrop, just like damn it, we couldn't do it. And then what do you got to do? You got to create like a custom object or throw it into an array, and then you feel impure, and then you know, it just all gets gets out of control. Take a shower afterwards. I'm like, my coat smells. My body must smell too, right? So that's what the idea of a tuple is. It's just a dumb container that I'm able to do things. And we can use tuples everywhere. But in order to get the information from a tuple is this. This is an underscore one. This is an underscore two to get the second tuple. And this one is underscore three. Yes, it is one based. It is not zero based, OK? If ever you need to figure out something in Scala, it either comes from Java, but if, you, if you've never seen it in Java before, then it probably came from Haskell. And that's, that's how you could probably uh, see that through. Always the tuple order, always the way yes, yes. Uh, it's not going to be a mystery and say, hello, I got this, uh, you got this new value that you weren't expecting yet. That's going to be ordered in the way they are. Yeah, but here's the thing, like an array is like everything is, uh, like you have an array of, of strings or whatever, they're, they're typically homogeneous. Tuples, on the other hand, are not. Take a look at this right over here. This is actually the type. So whatever element I put in, that constitutes the type itself. So this is actually called a tuple three. Let me rewrite, let me rewrite it as this, tuple three. So we have tuple two, tuple three, tuple four, tuple five, tuple six. Guess to what number, people? 22. Yeah, you nailed it. All right. So absolutely. So right over here, this is the same thing as writing this. The types definitely come along for the ride. That's going to be the important thing for this tuple. Uh, Scala is a static type language. So absolutely. Or uh, I'll do a zoom in here and... 50. If the things don't match up, then the compiler will not see you through. Okay. And so, yeah, if I, and so what's great about this, again, if I take out the first element from this, I get that int. I don't have to do any casting or any funky stuff with it. Okay. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Okay. Uh, no. Can you change, if I understand the question, can I change that integer to something else on the spot? And the answer is no. And the, and the reason I know that is not because of the tuple, is that everything usually by default in Scala is immutable. Once you done create it, you got to leave it as is. So, uh, and that's the reason. You can't change anything with it. If I did, sorry? Underscore zero. Okay. If you burn my computer, you owe me another computer. Uh, this, is not, this is not a method uh, at all. So it's not a member of it. Uh, so a tuple three is actually a class that has methods underscore one, underscore two, and underscore three with it. And of course, tuple four will have an underscore one, two, three, or four, all the way up to 22. No, it could be whatever it is that you want, okay? No, it could be three, four, five, 100. Yo. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. So the, the question is, when you create a tuple, yeah, good. Uh, thanks for reminding me about that. So when you create a tuple, oh, there we go. When you create a tuple, is it always int string or double? No, what's great about this is tuples are really the garbage cans within Scala. They'll, you can, take, you can place in whatever you want. Let me try uh, something else. This one is called a symbol. Uh, this one is, how about a float on that one? Or whatever, whatever kind of type. Ooh, how about a list of 0, 1, 3, 2, and 1? What kind of demon calling are you trying to do here? But yeah, no, you're right. So how about a tuple of 
Um, what I was going to say is just a couple of things. Is Chief still out there? <laughs> Greg is great. That is, that is a great tuffle. Yeah, that is absolutely awesome. Um, what, oh, how about a character? So you want to have a value with the blah, 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 blah. So we have a symbol. By the way, a symbol is kind of like a string, except it's a little bit safer. Um, you know, every, every, uh, the symbol 30201. Let me uh, rename that symbol. I think I'm probably going to get uh, pinched on that one. So uh, symbol of hello, a float, a list, and a tuple. I'm glad all of you are asking this kind of qu these kind of questions in here. So I have this. Take a look at this U. This is a tuple four. Okay. So I can do uh, U underscore one. I can do U underscore two. Notice in here that the types are correct. No casting involved with it. U underscore three. U underscore two. And U underscore, oh, there's no five, because I just said it was a four. But what's great about this is, uh, let me bring in U underscore uh, four. And since that was a tuple, and I can then do this. Now, it does look kind of funky, uh, but that underscore four is actually a method. So I could keep digging and digging and digging into these nested graphs of, of information and then just get out the information that I want, okay? And I love Scala. Sometimes when I, I love Scala so much, I like to kiss this knuckle mm, and kiss this one. I just do boom, boom, boom. All right. Yeah, please. No. Not, uh, so the question is, thanks for reminding me again if I forget. Uh, so if you have tuples within tuples, can you flatten them? No. Because here's, here, well, I think things are going to change within Scala 3. Uh, possibly in Scala 3, I'm not quite too familiar with that. Um, there may be the opportunity to flatten them. I'd have to go read the books there. But um, as of right now, for this Scala, no. Because uh, as of right now, tuples are just considered just dumb containers, not like collections, like for the flattening. Okay? No. So uh, here, I'll show you like all the different things that you can do. Uh, our REPL in here is tab based. So one, two, three, four, uh, copy it. So what, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I can answer this question. You can't change things in here, but you can call a copy, uh, which is something that uh, I rarely do. Uh, I don't know how copy works, actually. Cause I, I think this one just create. Uh, oh, look at that. Yeah, so it's a copy. Ah, beautiful. So here, let's take a look at copy. I know how this works now. So I hardly ever use it, but if you want to change an element in here, you would have to call this copy. So if I wanted to change that hello to world, the type still has to match up. So I could still keep 50 in here, keep the, or you know, I could do, uh, keep the U, uh, sorry, U2, okay, U3 and U4 in this, but I just want to change uh, the first part, that's the way that you would do it, okay? If, if you had done U1 instead, it's okay, it doesn't matter, because you're really copying it into a new tuple, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be wrong. I mean, it might not be what you want. Right, that's true. Yeah, so the question is, um, if I wanted to do everything exactly the same, I'm just going to get uh, two references that are different, different objects, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, please go. No, it's actually so. Um, so I just change it to world. Here's you. You is still hello, but uh, this copy in here. So you dot copy this. Um, so I, what I probably should have done in order to avoid confusion. So the question was, um, you know, aren't you violating immutability by calling this? Was the question. So right in here, what I should have done is I don't know v or or something like that. I should have assigned it to some sort of value so that I could use it afterwards. Yep. Go. Uh, I assume that there's a way to iterate through all of the variables. I think so. Uh, so if we take a look at you, there's something called a product iterator. I've never really had to uh, do, uh, uh, do that, but you could probably do a product iterator and uh, just iterate through all of these uh, as if it was an iterator. And I think, uh, let's see, I could do a to list on that. And there it is as a list. 
And then I could do something like for each on each one of these. Sorry, I think it's all small letters. And print line each one. And do, you know, do something like that. So, um, yep, you could do that. So you could definitely iterate off of it. Great question. So the question again, as I showed over here, is can you iterate from something in a tuple? Okay? Or tuple. Yep. Oh, sure, yes. Right. Is there anything copy does beyond just kind of another way of doing the tuple little? Um, no, I think that, that's probably pretty straightforward. Let me, let me try a little experiment here. So the question is uh, the purpose of copy. Now, usually a copy, I'm just going to run an experiment. I don't know if this is going to work or not. But one thing a copy can do is you can go into a property and change that property. I have no idea if this will work. So I'm just wondering if I could, what was the first one? It was a symbol, right? Uh, hello world, and I'll just change that to Denver. I have no idea if this will work. And it did. Oh, this is a good day, everyone. All right. So I learned something new just based on that. So what's that? Oh, yeah, kiss the... Mm. Ba boom All right, yeah, so great. Thanks for that question there. So yeah, that's... Uh, I knew some, that's what copy had done, but I never tried that with a tuple. So yeah, absolutely, thanks for that question. Okay, Groovy? All right. No, Scala, yeah. So every time I say Groovy when I'm excited, I'm just gonna be, okay, Scala, all right. You know what that means, that'll be our inside joke. So when I come back into this uh, code over here, since all of you are Scala professionals now, uh, so this tuple first is something that will uh, take a tuple of string and int. Let me tell you something about tuples here really quick. Uh, something that I need to tell you. This right in here is so this is Greg's net worth All right, see that pause there? Okay. So Greg's a ultra billionaire? I don't know, is that a billion? Anyways. Sure, yeah. So let's say I want a tuple of a string called Greg's net worth and uh, a number in here. Oh, sorry, Greg. Uh, I'm going to have to. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> your, your wealth can only be limited by what an integer has. All right, so uh, here's Greg's net worth, arrow, and then the value. This will give you a tuple, too. This is just a decoration. Uh, that we can use. And uh, I may be uh, losing on some time here. So uh, let me discuss just a, a few more functions in here. So uh, this right in here, I could have used an arrow on this part, but I have a tuple first. This function says if you give me a tuple, I will return a string. And the thing that I want to do with this is t underscore one. Okay? Just give me the first one. That's all this function is going to do. This function here is get first three letters. If you give me a string, I'm just going to return the first three letters of it. So what would be cool is if I could chain these together. Remember, G comes first in this sort of thing. So that will come right in here. Because like F of G of X, the G of X has to happen first. And so when we take a look at this compose, this is the way that we look at it. F is this get the first three letters. So in other words, what this is going to do is it's going to fish inside of a tuple, pull out that string, and then I'm going to take a substring of it. And so this is a very confusing call in here. So if I say new function with Arizona and three, what is new function? It is the composition of these two functions together. One is get me the first three letters, or uh, sorry, I'm already doing it the wrong way. One is uh, do a tuple first, take out the first tuple, and then get the first three letters from that first tuple. So if I say Arizona comma three, then I will get RE in return. Now, if that's too confusing for you, the best option for this is and then, which is the same thing, but you just write it as what you want to do first and then do something else and then do something else and so on and so forth, okay? All right, groovy. So um, 
let's discuss some of these things that you can do. And I think all of you know what a map is. Uh, what is this stream in here? Stream is just another collection. So I could do stream. Um, so let's, uh, let me try this one. This one is uh, stream. Let's see. Oh, that, it is a from. I was wondering why I didn't do a from. So this is a stream from one. Take a look how this looks. This is an infinite stream. Right, you just keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. Okay? And so what I could do from a stream is that I can take like 40 elements from this. Okay? And it's still here, but this is limited. All right? So it's ending. So it's either bounded or unbounded. This first one over here, this from one, is unbounded. The second one is bounded because it's only going to go from 1 to 40. Okay? So I could do something like this. Make string on this one. And this would give me uh, 1 through 40. Okay? Make string is great. Uh, but if I try to do this, I'm not going to because I'm kind of in the middle of a presentation right now. Like if I didn't do a take, what would happen? Yeah, this wouldn't stop, computer would buzz, blow up, and things like that, okay? So that would definitely be unbounded, okay? So that is a stream. So this right here is stream uh, one, comma two, that two is a step. So I could do, here, let me kind of rewrite that one again. So if I do uh, one with a step of two, then I have one, three, five, seven, nine, et cetera, okay? Um, so yeah, I could apply a map. There's map over here. I could apply a map on different kinds of collections. How many of you in Java 8 have used optionals now? Okay, okay. I think they're great, okay? Everyone knows about, um, uh, who is that? I don't wonder why I can't uh, re uh, remember. Uh, who is the uh, gentleman who had apologized for null? What was his name? Sir Anthony Richard Hoare, there it is. Sir Anthony, uh, take a look at his, uh, at the Wikipedia article. He had apologized for inventing the word null, okay? So this one avoids that particular null. The way we have it here in Scala is the following. Sum 10, or yeah, sum 10 in here, ah, has a type, okay? And there it is, sum int. This means, I, yes, I have an answer, and the answer is 10, okay? If I do not have an answer, I will have a none, okay? Some and none have a parent called option. We don't use the word optional, okay? But we use the word option. It's the way that we can guarantee that we have something. One of the popular ways that we can see that is something like this. Let's say I have a map called one and one and two and two over here, okay? Let me assign this to a value. And this is a map. Remember I just told you about that arrow and what that arrow was? This is really an associated list of tuples, is what a map is, okay? And that's what I'm doing here. Now, I could have written it like this, okay? But that's a lot of parentheses. And I don't want anyone thinking that I'm writing closure. Sorry, closures. I love you. All right. So right in here, this is, you know, an associated list of uh, tuple twos, and that's my map. Now, if I call map get one, what do I get in return? An option. I don't get nulls or uh, the value itself. I have this. So what I could do with this is um, I could do a get or else. So I could uh, say uh, get or else. Let's see, what kind of signature is this? Not all four of those uh, possibilities. Let's see, I don't think this is the right signature. Yeah, this one is, let's see. I guess I've never used this one, maybe. Yeah, there we go. So since one is available there, this one will say one. I have used this one, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and then if I have a six over here, this will say none of the above. So everything is safe. That's what I absolutely like about this language, okay? And I could just determine where the things are safe. But the thing about an option is this. Option three, oh, I'm sorry, not an option three, sum of three, is that I can also map this as well. Ah. 
So I could take the information inside of this sum and add a 4 to it. Okay? So this is what's kind of called a functor. Anything that has a map is of a type functor. Okay? So map, the classification of a map will make it a functor, which we'll just talk about here very shortly. Okay? So by the way, let's say I have this. I'm going to do not here. This is of a type of int. And I'm going to do none. Okay. Okay. What do you think is going to happen when I do this? What do you think this is going to return? None. Got it. Really good. Okay. So this means that it has built in um, error handling. Okay. So option list, a lot of these collections just happen to be um, something that sometimes you hear the term monadic, uh, but they happen to be that if you have a list or if you have a collection or if you have a container of something and it has map and it has flat map in it, then it's, cons then it's usually termed to be monadic. Okay? Filter is going to be one of those as well. Okay? And the thing about containers that have both flat map, map, and filter, and they have a good and evil side to it, what is that good and evil side? So what's the good and evil side for this right here, this option? Some or none, that's pretty easy. Some means it has something. None means it doesn't have anything, so that's the evil side. If evil ever crops up, the whole thing's going to be evil. <laughs> kind of sad, right? But anytime there's a none, the whole thing is going to be considered a none. That's your quality of error when that happens, okay? So what we end up having here is something very much like Groovy has. What's that question mark operator that you have with Groovy? That if something was null, it's not going to uh, continually pass through, right? Was it the Elvis operator? Okay. Or null safety, something like that. Yeah, so um, that's kind of what's happening here. We actually use our, our flat maps and our maps for this sort of error handling. And the types that we use are monadic. They have a flat map, they have a map, and they have a good side and they have an evil side. <laughs> okay? Uh, what is the good and evil list, if you were to guess? What's a good and evil list? What's a good, uh, let's, uh, let's rephrase it this way. What's a good and evil refrigerator? What would be a good refrigerator in your estimation? It's full. What would be the evil refrigerator? Totally empty, right? That's the quality of it. So if I did a, a list, here, let's do a list right over here, a list of one, two, three, four, and I did a map on it, I can do something with it. But what if, oh, by the way, what if my list is empty? Now, really quick here, if I do a list on this, just out of curiosity. So this is a list of int. But if I do an empty list, what is this a list of? Nothing. Yeah. Just a little fun little fact here. So I'm going to do a, a, a thing here on Scala hierarchy. Scala type hierarchy. Let me just bring up this image right in here. And here it is. Okay. This is kind of an older version, but it'll pass. Okay. <laughs> Take a look here. What's, one, what's kind of cool about Scala is that we have subtypes. You're like, what? Like Java is like top to bottom, right? But there's no bottom. I mean, it just fans out and never like um, tapers down. But over here we have Null and nothing. What? Nothing is the subtype of everything. If you're looking for a really cool badass tattoo in old English letters across your chest, nothing is a subtype of everything, no one will ever mess with you. Unless other Scala programmers who know what that means, they'll be like, oh, do you do Scala as well? <laughs> All right, but yeah, that's what this type is here. So whenever we do a list of nothing, that's a list of nothing. And if I add an element to it, let's say I add a, an element of, 
uh, Matt Rabel into this. Okay. What do you think the type is going to be for result here? A list of string. Kind of cool, right? Because of that immutability. So we don't have raw types. We actually have a generic type that's associated with everything. That's kind of cool. Okay. But where was I with, uh, with this? List that is empty, if I try to do a map of this, what is going to be the result? Uh, nothing. All right. Ooh, that's kind of an interesting thing here, which would make sense because I just showed you a list of nothing. So let me do L2. I'll call it, or I'll call it V2. <laughs> I need to call, I need to give it a type in there so I can at least do something with it because it says a list of nothing. I need to give it some sort of type with this. So let's say now I have this V2, and now I'll do a map. Now I'll ask you again, <laughs> uh, what do you think this is going to be? Now will be an empty list, okay? If you have the evil side of any monad, you're just going to continually have uh, the evil side of that particular monad. If I do a none with a map, that will just end up with a none. If I have an empty vector, and I do a map on it, that will just be an empty vector, okay? That's what they are. Go. Yeah, that's and yeah, that's part of the, the classification as well, and that's why we're able to do these sort of things. Everything by default is going to be uh, immutable, correct? Mm -hmm. So coming in over here, that's what that does. So if we take a look here, that sum, if you take a look at that one line 63 over here, sum of 10 map, if I add a 40 to it, then I'll get sum of 50 which is kind of interesting as well, right? That's the other kind of classification of something that is monadic, is that I'm applying something but still keeping the same structure. In other words, I'm going into that container and changing it, but it's still that same container. If you do a map on a list, or even in Java, a map of a Java 8 stream, you're still dealing with a Java 8 stream. That has not changed at all, okay? So, here's something cool on this one here. Here's a map structure. Let's see what time it is, because I may have to um, jettison some of these in here. So this one is applying a map uh, to everything in here. So what is going on here? For each one of these key values in here, I am doing a map on this, and I'm taking each tuple and creating a new tuple. So I'm taking one to one, two to two, and three to three, and I'm making them into what? 100, 200, and 300. Okay, so I can map key values. Everyone knows what a filter is. Okay, pretty happy with a filter. But let me ask you this. Everyone still is okay with filter, right? Filter is, I just want to apply. So here it is again, just in case you don't know. I can't assume everything. Filter will take a function that returns a Boolean. So this is getting all the even numbers from this. Okay. Filters everywhere, it's very useful. It's one of the big three, or I like to call, call them the big three, and filter would just filter the information. But the key is now, how many of you are familiar with flat map? Be honest, how many of you are good with flat map? All right, I will announce this right now. From here on out, you have to be good with flat map. If you want to be a data engineer, you have to be good with flat map. If you want to be good with big data, you have to be good with flat map. If you want to do stream processing, you have to be good with flat map. If you want to do, well, I said big data, but if you want to do anything with Spark, you have to be good with flat map. Flat map, flat map, flat map, flat map. Uh, when you leave and get in your car, shed, shed some tears and say, I really don't understand flat map yet, but I will tomorrow. Okay? Because it's that important. So, flat map, and I'm going to do kind of the same thing as over here, but I'm just going to make this a little bit more interactive. So, list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And I'm going to do a map on each one of these. And I'm going to do a times 3. We know what that is. Okay? That's just going to multiply 3 of everything in here. But if I do a list of negative x, x, and x plus 1, what type is this going to return? List of list. Okay? Now, here's the thing. If you do a map and you did not want a list of a list, but let's say you had a vector and you did a map, um, and you didn't want a vector of a vector, or I had a sum of four, for example, and I did a map, 
that for the element that's coming in, I did another sum of this, and let's say I wanted to do uh, x times 4 in here, I'm going to end up with, well, in this case, an, uh, well, it is a sum of a sum on the right-hand side over here. So let me just tell it to you this way for those that are not familiar with flat map. If you have a list of a list, a set of a set, a map of a map, an option of an option, uh, if you use RxJava, an observable of an observable, if uh, you end up using streams in Java 8 and you have a stream of a stream, <sighs> if you end up using um, uh, Pivotal's flux and you have a flux of a flux, right? Me uttering the uh of an uh, and it, uh, that's going to look great on video, by the way. Um, <laughs> don't pause it there. So if you ever end up uttering, I got an uh of an uh after I did a map, then perhaps what you wanted to do was to flatten it. And see what that looks like? Now, the combination of flatten and map becomes your new friend and my friend, and I'd like to introduce you to my friend, and that friend is called flat map. Winner, winner, chicken dinner, okay? So, I was... Um, doing a job for develop intelligence uh, over in Florida uh, with a group I, I really, really do like. Uh, but the job was to uh, uh, teach Java to C-sharp developers, okay? Of course, these C-sharp developers were like, where the hell do we have to learn Java? Our language rules. And, uh, and uh, they continued on. I know we copied Java, whatever. But we hired all the brains and we just made it better than Java, so why are we even here? I'm like, all right, I get it, whatever. I just have a job to do, so just bear with me. So we were learning Java, and they were like, meh, whatever. And then I started with the functional programming aspect of it. And I told them about map and flat map. And all of a sudden, they were bummed out. They were like, oh. I'm like, what's wrong? And I was like, we, we, don't, we don't have map or flat map. And I told them, that's because your language sucks. <laughs> But I, I couldn't let it hold. They were a great, great group of people. Uh, but I said, that's nah, not true. Come on. You're C-sharp. You had, they had functions like in, what, 2006? And like, when did we get them? That was just fairly recently. Uh, so they've had it. And the words that they use for map is select and select many. That's the C-sharp one. So I like that word because if you take a look right over here, what are we doing? List and map, and then for every element that I am getting, I'm returning a plural. So what I want you to do is build an I for this pattern. If you do a map and take every element and you return a plural of something, then what you want to do is likely a flat map. Okay? There you go. You could do big data and, and all these streaming frameworks now. Okay? Because that's going to be your key. Okay? Now, just to save some time... I usually do this one over here, but let's work on this one and uh, talk a little bit about it. Okay? Who sings this song? And what's the name of the song? What's that? It is a wonderful world. Okay, good. Uh -huh. Good detective work. Yeah, there we go. And uh, Louis Armstrong. Okay? So these are lyrics. L-Y-R-I-C-S. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a map now, each one of these is a sentence, right? I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. So for every sentence that is coming in, uh, what I want to do, let's say I just want to do a word count, which is something you see in just about every example for any kind of big data framework or Spark or anything like that. But let's break it down and understand what this means. So for every sentence that is coming in, I want to break this sentence apart, which is in Java kind of the same thing as this split it, and I want to split it by that uh, space. And here it is, okay? Done. What did I end up with? A plural of a plural, an uh of an uh. Well, yes, it's, one's a list, one's an array, but they're both collections. So I could just say a collection of a collection, okay? There's my key. Sometimes it's not obvious that I'm returning something plural. I mean, it is if you think about it, but um, it is a plural. So I will do a flat map. Okay. Cool, there it is. And now I have these words. What can I do with this? Well, I could take every word now, uh, convert it to lowercase. Aren't these functions great? Convert it to lowercase. I could then, uh, let's see, 
let's for each one of these, let's say I want to do a group by, that for every word that I have, I want to group by uh, the first character of each one. So this is data aggregation in one-liners, okay? You could do a lot of great work as long as you master that flat map, okay? So S, C, and C. Y, U, T, trees, to, them, think, too. And if I want to, I could do a count of each one of these. Uh, let me call a map values, which is a map. Uh, here, I'll bring this up here. But this will map the value section, which is a list. I'll call it XS over here. And uh, I want the size of each one. Data aggregation at its finest, right? So for each one of these, I have two, I have two words with S's. One with Y, T with 5, etc. Okay? So, let's come back over here. What happens if I wanted to do a true word count? Here's the way it looked before. I would just do a group by. And I'm going to take every word, and what do I want to group by? That word. And here it is. So this would be the word, and I could go about it the same way. So for each word in here, by the way, this W to W that you see here, it's called the identity function, okay? Just give me that one thing and I'm going to throw it out, all right? Then, map values. And uh, for each one of these uh, values in here, I'm just going to call that XS, and then I will do a size for it, okay? And there's my word count. Flat map is your absolute power tool, okay? Let me show you one other thing for flat map, and then I'm going to go over to a, a quick thing on implicits because I'm just taking a look at the time here. Um, it is 7.44. Uh, Greg, when, uh, when's the uh, time? 8.15 or something? Yeah-ish, uh, maybe a little before if you can. Okay. Just because our reservations are for 8.30. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, no problem. You, c you could drink beer whenever. All right. So what? Uh, it does, yeah, one level. So it goes ka-chung. And then you would have to, you know, keep doing it. But, yeah, it just goes one level down. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've known this before, and certainly you could do this in, um, um, in, um, in Java. I don't know how, how far deep you can, but it really is good for data mangling. So take a look here. I have class employee. This is, by the way, how we create a class. And uh, I have a manager with it. Let me bring this over to the REPL so that way I could describe it uh, a little bit uh, better. I did terrible there. So one is this right over here, no Mac. All right. This right over here, I'm creating an employee, and this employee has membership of a first name and a last name, member variables with it. Manager over here is a class that has first name, last name, and a list of employees that's under the purview of that particular manager. Okay? And that's what these are. Okay? So I'm going to do a control D on here. So I've defined a uh, class called employee and manager. Now what this will do here is, let's say I have uh, some of these employees here. Simon Simons, Roger Japan, Yasmina Greco, and Norway, Carlos Canada. And uh, those are my employees. So a list of employees that are going to be fed into the managers. Okay? Um, so one thing that we can do is something like this. Okay? So here are the managers and here are the employees. But one of the things that I could do is if I wanted to get all the list of employees without having to dig in there, without going through a for loop or anything like that, flat map again is your friend. Because let's say I'm going to bring all this in. I'll just I'm going to bring this in into the REPL here. I have this thing called a paste mode in here. Okay, so here it is. I have list of employees, employees one and two, manager. Uh, I have manager one and two. But what I could do is if I have that list of a manager one, which also has the list of all those employees, I could start off with something like this. And then if I, have, if I try out a map of uh, each manager that comes in and ask for those employees, then I'd have a list of a list. And there it is again. Okay? 
So that plural can come from anywhere. It could come from like, you know, one object having a plural of something else. That for every one object, I want to get that plural from here. So right over here, it could be that flat map. So if I get a list of managers, I could use flat map to fish into all the employees. And if I want to determine, I don't know what the average, uh, average salary is for every employee, and all I have access to are the managers, I can use some functional programming to start digging into object graphs very nicely as well, okay? Lots of data mangling, and that's why flat map just is a very important one, okay? So I'm gonna skip on topics here, and uh, I'm going to go to implicits here really quick. So that way I could discuss a case class. And implicits are kind of fun. What am I kidding? They're, they're absolutely fun. So I'm going to do this implicit right over here, and I'll bring it over to the REPL so that way we can concentrate on it. So I showed you how functions work. Take a look at that REPL, I mean, not that REPL, but that GitHub repository that I provided for you. I have lots of other examples of functions. Learn about scan, learn about some of the others there. But I'm going to move on to implicits because I think it's absolutely worth a discussion. Implicit is this. It is an imaginary <laughs> map within a scope where the key is the type and the value is that actual value. So within this scope, there's going to be a key called int and there's going to be a value called 100. Boom. Okay? And that I could say, okay, implicitly, give me something that is of this uh, type int right in here. And it's going to say, okay, I'm going to look around the scope here and I found 100. And I'll go ahead and bring that in. Okay? So you are defining something somewhere within that scope. Okay? What can I use it for? Well, one of the things that I could use it for is kind of like a default value. Here, I'll just go ahead and, uh, and highlight this right over here. And I could use it for something like a default value. Let's take a look at this top one over here. Right now it's in the middle. See that implicit val rate of 100? I am establishing that whenever somebody needs an integer, it's always going to be 100. And that'll be that default value that I can use. Okay? So given this count payment here, I want to do hours and um, an implicit uh, value. Let's say uh, instead of n, I should call it wage but I have an implicit wage that all my employees get. And that'll be my implicit value. So this right over here would, the thing that I have highlighted over here, would just bring in 100, okay? So if I call 50 with 100, that value is going to be 5,000, okay? In other words, this is scope-based. And you're probably thinking, okay, not a big deal. I don't, <laughs> I don't get it. One of the things that's really great about it is if we're constantly using a variable or some kind of type over and over again, um, we could make it implicit so that way we don't have to type that much. So one of them, and I'll just leave this over here, one of them is this right over here, is how we do concurrent programming uh, within um, Scala. So here it is right over here. So Let's say that I want to build a future, and this is a future in Scala, so here's a, a really good use case here. And so I have right over here, let me highlight this part. I have a thread pool, fixed thread pool, so uh, four threads on it. And then I have this thing in here called an execution context. How many of you do uh, futures now within Java? Okay. Uh, in futures in Java, you have something called an executor, and an executor represents a thread pool. So I could create a, thre a cache thread pool that would have, you know, 10 threads whenever we need it. Um, fixed thread pool is a fixed amount, so this one's saying I, on I only have uh, four threads at my disposal. And it's called an executor. This is a Java call. That's why I have this uh, annotated with... Uh, with Java, okay? So this is my executor here. And this ex execution context is a wrapper around an, a Java executor. 
and it provides me with a lot of Scala cool stuff that I can use to calculate futures and things like that and do my concurrent programming. Now, a future is something that will run a process on a separate thread until completion. And once it's completed, it stays in that state forever. Okay? If you're going to do any kind of reactive programming, if you're going to do any kind of concurrent programming, uh, if you're going to do streaming, if you're going to do data pipelining, futures are it as well. And I'm sorry, there's just going to have to be more to learn from here on out. You have your flat map to do, and then you have your futures to uh, be able to handle as well. And so this is our new reality. If we have work to do, we want to take that work and we want to put this on another thread so our main thread can continue on and process information. Okay? That's going to be a, one of the stronger requirements to what's going on with reactive programming. So this future apply right over here, uh, this is going to be operating on a different thread. What do we know about apply? There it goes. Don't need to call it. Again, if you see that word apply, you don't need to call it. So whatever's inside of this block right over here is operating on a different thread. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this implicit right over here. See what happened? See these uh, underbars in here or underscores? This one's complaining about something. What is it complaining about? This one says right over here, let me kind of hover over that again. No implicits found for execution context. I need an execution context to run this. I need a thread pull in order to run this. That's what this is saying. So if I don't have implicits, what do I have to do? I don't know what it's trying to have me do over here. Okay, there it goes. Uh, so what is it wanting me to do? Well, it wants me to plug in the execution context over here. Uh, take that. Now that's okay. And now this is okay. And now this is okay. All right? Everywhere where it's requiring that execution context, I need to provide it there. This amounts to a lot of noise when it comes to the language. So what one thing implicits allows us to do is cut down on that noise, okay? This is why, anybody do Spark? Okay. This is why when you do Spark, and if you've ever compared a Java Spark job versus a Scala Spark job, they're almost like two different beasts because you got to plug in everything explicitly <laughs> with the Java job. But over here, implicits really save us some time because the implicits allows us to do something like this. Oh, it's not that one. I did the wrong one. Sorry. Here it is. And I could do the implicit right in here. And because I have this implicit, I don't need to be that explicit everywhere I use it. And now everything now just looks like beautiful, syntactical, functional programming. And it makes me cry. Yep. Yes. So the question is, I, I hope I got the question right. So given this val, it takes the type and then whatever object gets created from it. Yes, within this scope now, I have a map that has the key of the type, which is execution context, and that object, which is uh, really the thread pool that we need. So anywhere that we need a thread pool, I don't have to explicitly program that in. That is automatically going to be a, a attributed to wherever we need it to be. Okay? Less calls, less work for me to do. Okay? There's a downside to it. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to lie to you about stuff. Uh, one of the problems with this is hunting down implicits in case there are too many. We try not to abuse it, and generally it's pretty easy, I think, to hunt for it. Maybe I, I just have some experience in there, and I'm lying to you. I hope not, but uh, generally they are easy to do it. Uh, IntelliJ and Eclipse do a fantastic job of telling you what implicits you are looking at. Yeah, question. Here we go. Yes. So the question is, uh, can you run a foul because you have two keys of the same type? Let me just take your question and rephrase that. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So if I have, 
Here, let me reset my REPL by calling reset over here, okay? And if I do val rate int 100, and if I do val um, um, amount or months, how about that? Yeah, there we go. Months like this, and let's say that's going to be one month over here, okay? And I decided that, here, let me do it this way, uh, def calc uh, x int uh, implicit so I need something implicit from within my scope, and I need this int in here, and I just want to do an x plus y in this case here. And then I call calc with 4, then boom. The types do matter. Now here's the thing. The, no. All implicits are at compile time. Because at runtime, everything is just Java. You do have Java bytecode, okay? So if your manager is a jerk and says you have to do everything in Java, um, you could just lie to him or her and say, okay, that's cool. And then write in Scala and they don't know any better. Okay, you do whatever you want. But anyways, but yes, all of that is Java bytecode in the end. That's all you're dealing with. These are just dot class files that you have at the end. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. So it's all like one, if I understand, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt on that one. But yeah, this is just going to be one function. It's just going to be true Java that you have at the very end. Do all the processing uh, and do all the inlining that is absolutely necessary for your bytecode in order to run it as fast as possible, okay? So yeah, compiler does most of the work. Now I will tell you a disadvantage of Scala and uh, what, um, and it's a good disadvantage. So one thing that you may find with Scala, and they're doing, you know, they're doing a lot of incredible work to making sure that it's as fast as possible. Your slowness is going to be at compile time, not at runtime. The reason, programmer friendliness, they're trying to do all these nice implicit things so you don't have to do this all the time and, oh, that hurts. Uh, they want you to be able to express yourself in a nice manner, but unfortunately, because of that, they kind of have to tear things apart and reassemble them at Compile time, so that way it makes it easy for you, okay? All right. So, just taking a quick look at the time here. So, that's what an implicit is. There are a lot of great things that an implicit will do. And um, just running out of time here, so let me just highlight some of the greatest things that an implicit will do. So, let's take a look at int wrapper right over here. I'm going to create a class called int wrapper. This is just using the decorator pattern um, or the wrapper pattern or the adapter pattern, however you want to call it. And I want to decorate int. Java programmers in here, does int have a is odd or an is even? No. But what if I could make it? Okay. I feel like a weird salesman. What if I can give you right now for the special low price of $19.99 an is odd or an is even? We can do so with Scala, okay? So, let me paste this right over here, and I'm gonna create this int wrapper, and here it is, okay? It is a wrapper pattern. I am wrapping around int, as you see over here. And I have two methods, is odd and is even, okay? So, now what? Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna tell the compiler, and again, I'm glad you asked that question, I'm gonna tell the compiler what's up with this implicit over here, and I'm going to say, hey, implicit, I have a little rule for me. If you find something that you don't really understand compiler, like is odd and is even in here, then what I could do is uh, just give the compiler some help in here and say, I've got this method here called int to int wrapper that if you provide me this int right in here, I am going to take that int and wrap it up into that int wrapper. And here it is. Okay? Now, this is a warning. It's Scala saying, wow, you are super duper, Dan. And if you want to do this kind of cool, funky stuff, then I need you to import this Let me do that again. It wasn't an error, it was just a, there it is. So I am telling the Scala compiler, hey, if you, if you see something weird that's being called on an int, check with me first. 
check with this implicit first. And now what I could do is I could say 4 or 3 is odd or 3 is even. Okay? Some languages call this an extension. Okay? Um, I just call it awesomeness. Okay? Cool. And that's something that an implicit can do. Okay? In fact, these implicits happen everywhere in Scala and you just don't know it yet. In other words, when I do 4 plus 10 in Scala, this is the same thing as 4 plus, I'm invoking the plus method, sorry, new computer, so I'm kind of new at this uh, keyboard. Take a look here. When you're invoking plus, you are actually invoking the plus method. Yes, we have operator overloading. You are actually invoking the plus method on that number. Okay? You just don't see it there. Another implicit. You saw this one already. This one creates a tuple too. So a lot of the awesomeness that you see within the language, they are implicits at work. Okay? Something else an implicit does before I go into a type class is, um, shoot, I just, I just space out. Oh, what, oh yeah, I remember now. How many of you absolutely, absolutely love java.math.bigintegr? You just love it with all your heart. You love doing simple math with it. You love doing this. You just, here I could do it. By the way, it's interoperable uh, with Java. So uh, tell me, how do you create a big integer? You do something like this, right? And then pass it like, blah, blah, right? Yeah, so absolutely right. Okay, so here's big right over here. How do you add, let's say I have this big integer here. How do you add 20 in Java? You got to do what? Big? Is it plus or add? Is it add? Oh, yeah, here it is. And then what do you got to do? New. Oh, no. Oh, man. Uh, ow. Ow. All right. So my fingers hurt. What's going on? Because I just, man, I just want to add two. Now, I know there's a big integer, zero and, and one, but like, oh, okay. Oh, that hurts. So how do I how do I do this in Scala? Okay. Okay. Here it is. That's a capital B. What do you think we're calling? We're not a class, but an object, and we're calling the apply on it. Again, apply is absolutely important all this. Okay, remember operator overloading and all this implicit goodness in here. One of the things that we could do with an implicit is a conversion. Who doesn't love Scala, right? How long have you been typing? Oh, man, I'm feeling like this is more like an infomercial. How long have you been doing this in suffering, right? And so that's one of the cool things that you get with Scala. These implicits really bring a lot of nicety for the programmer. Okay? No more suffering. Okay? Come to us. All right. Another implicit thing, and let me introduce you to a type class. Okay? Read more about it at this, uh, at this uh, GitHub. Okay? I have different wrappers and I have different exercises and converters on how to do these wrappers. They're all in these kind of like beautiful tests uh, that you can uh, use, okay, and see what they do. But I'm going to talk about a type class because I said I was going to talk about a type class within this, okay? What if you could, so one of the pain points within Java, I think, is it's almost like you have this hard-coded contract Whenever you create an object and um, you have to do your what? Two string, your equals, and your hash code. Let's just focus on the two string and the equals, okay? You create a class with that two string and that equals and you're stuck, right? Once you decide on an implementation for two string and equals, what are the chances that you could change it afterwards? Probably very minimum because everything else is expecting a particular equals and a particular hash code. 
You can't change that uh, anymore. I think it was one of those just flaws that Java has. And, you know, we've all progressed as programmers. They didn't know it at the time, but, um, you know, we probably want something more. So let's think about this then. I'm going to start off with this trait, which is very much, again, like a interface, okay? So let's describe what a type class is and see if it rocks your world, okay? So I have a trait loggable with a def log on this. Remember, this is a generic, so this is a type T of whatever type T could be. Everyone got that? Like, kind of like E or whatever you see in, in Java. So this is something called loggable. Think about it as like your two string. Okay, that's the trait that I want to build this upon, okay? And let's say I have a class called employee. And here it is, class employee, okay? Now, sometimes I want an employee's two string just to be the first name. Sometimes I want it to be the last name. If I had an employee with an employee number, maybe I want the employee ID as well, okay? So what I'm able to do is the following, and I'll, I could just probably uh, type the uh, rest out in here. Let's say I'm going to create a method called my two string in here, where I will have some generic, I'll, I'll rename it A just to provide some kind of difference in here. And I am happy to bring in an A in here as a parameter, but just like I showed you before, I could use something of an implicit value. You know, kind of know what an implicit is. And this implicit will be um, I'll call it a two stringy thing. <laughs> okay, as the variable in here. And what I want to bring in is something of this loggable of that same type. Okay. Let's think about this one. So this is a method of my two string. It is generic, so I could send in whatever types that I want to. And then I have this implicit with a loggable. What's loggable? That's a trait right up there. Of that loggable, but this time an A. Because as you can see right over here, this A represents, sorry, represents this type right over here. Okay? So I have this A in here. And what's my implementation going to be? Well, I will call two stringy thing, <laughs> okay, which is a loggable, and I'm going to call log for that item, which is A. Done. Okay? So, what does this do for us? So, let's say now I have an employee and I want to create an implicit rule on this one. So implicit val loggable of employee. And now all I have to do is just create a definition of what is the implementation for a two string for my employee. And I could do this in scope. Think about that one. A two string if you're doing one thing and on an entirely different class, another two-string implementation for doing something else. You're now not going to pay the penalty now for committing the wrong two-string on a class years ago that now you have to do some kind of finagling with it. Now you could have any, whatever kind of two-string you want, depending on the context. And you could strategically decide which two-string that you want. Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Heck yes. So, new loggable, and remember I'm putting the implicit here, so I'm actually turning this on for loggable employee. So new loggable employee, here's the type that's associated with it, and I need a method in here called log, and what is this now? This is an employee. So what is my implementation for a two string on this? This is called string interpolation in Scala, and so I could do, well, this is an employee. Uh, I'll use a colon in this. And I'm going to uh, get this employee. And let's say I just want to use first name. Okay? I don't care, right? 
If I want to print out an employee just with a first name, remember all this is per scope, so who cares? It's, it's not something that is something that I have to commit to and it's going to affect everything else in my program. I could just do this per the scope. And so, given that now, uh, here it is. And it's all wrong. Yay. All right. Uh, let's see. Error must be uh, in this match. What am I doing wrong here? New loggable employee. I thought I did that part right. And I am returning a string of this. So here's that string. And oh, I know what I did. Sorry about that, everybody. It seems I forgot about Java. I forgot to give it a variable name. Ho oh, ho. So here we go again. Log and that. Okay. So there we go. There's that implicit val. So now what I could do is let's scroll up here past my errors. Is that I can call a my two string with that object. So let's say that given this employee, new employee, okay, I paid top dollar for this person, and I'm going to have Matt Rabel uh, for this employee in here, okay, Val M R, okay. Now, if I want to do a two string of Matt Rabel, and again, my specific implementation of this is I only want to print out his first name. I'm going to call this my two string right over here. And I'm going to say my two string for this using MR. But remember, the other group of the parameter is what? An implicit. So I don't need to declare it. All I have to do is, is call this method, and this returns here employee mat. Now think about how cool this is, is because I can then just strategically decide which one I want to use. Okay? Now, let's go back to my code over here. So if you want to take a look at this code for yourself, what's happening here? Let me just take, take a look at the time. Okay? Need to uh, wrap up here soon. I have the same thing. Logable t, log t of string. I have this class in here, and I have this object, my employee, pre-def. Okay? Look what I have here. I have a wonderful candy assortment of all these implicit two strings that I can use. So depending on my situation then, all I have to do is strategically think about what I want to import. What behavior do I want to import? In this particular scope, if I want to do a two string where it's last name then first name, I get to decide right in here what it is that I want to use. That's awesome. Okay. And so, right in here, if I want to do write out Carly Simon, um, since I am bringing in last, um, let's see, I don't know why that one should be, uh, oh yeah, Simon Carly, of course, because it's last then first, then I have a different two-string implementation over here. And that's pretty powerful. So let me just end up with uh, this part right over here. So one of the things that uh, is uh, pretty exciting, and you could take a look, at this uh, particular repo over here is one project that I've been absolutely loving within the last uh, year or maybe two years. It's called Type Level Cats. And Type Level Cats has a lot of these type classes for you. One's called EQ. This is the EQ type class and it allows you to do a two equals. The thing that I just showed you was show. That's a type class that does your two string implementation. This isn't really that hard. Here's a monoid. Monoids aren't things that hurt when you sit down. Monoids, in this case, are, uh, are things when you want to add things together. Okay? I know I need a, a finish up. But like, if you want to add two strings together, what is that? A concatenation of two strings. If you want to add two numbers together, what is that? Addition. Okay? That's what a monoid is. How do you bring things together? Okay? Functor. I just told you what a functor was. What is a functor? Functor is a map. If you want to declare it in a little different way, you can do so over here. It's just a different way of thinking. Okay? And you could change the way a map uh, performs as well. So all these are in here. EQ, um, functor, 
monoid, show, etc. Now I know I'm running out of time. Let me give you this. On that repo, I have some challenges for you if you want to take them on. They range from easy to really hard. And I give these in my Scala class. So this one, functional challenge. Uh, using the functions we covered, write factorial, but don't use a for loop or a while loop. Use the functions for it. More advanced ch uh, challenge, create a grid like this. So grid two should be equal to one, two, three, four. That bar right there is strip margin, so that way it just, uh, it just gets rid of that margin there for you, okay? A little harder challenge. And the hardest challenge of all, and then I'll shut up after this, this one I learned from NPR Puzzle back in 2001, and it's something I did in Java and Scheme. I don't know if you've ever used Scheme before. But take a look at this one, okay? This is for the hardcore. So this one is Todd, Omar, Dave, Drew. Take a look at this grid right over here. Todd, it goes that way, and Todd goes down, right? Omar goes down and across the second one, second column and second row. Dave is third row, third column. Drew is fourth row and fourth column. See how that works that way? Find the female name, or find the female cube, and use functional programming for it, okay? Nice. That's a tough one. You'll spend a week or months, whatever. You'll suffer with that one. And, and if you go to the photo I took um, at this meeting, I did include the repo in the comments in, to that. So mm -hmm. that's there as well. I'll go to include this here. Okay? Awesome. All right. So, had a lot to talk about. So, um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you take to Scala and uh, hope this is beneficial to you all. Thanks. Well, thank you. I'm joining after, yes. Okay, so um, I sent Betty over.